Okay, we are live. All right, good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening for some wildfire preparedness information. Uh, my name is Nate Armstrong. I'm the deputy chief for CAL FIRE that oversees the wildland firefighting mission in both San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. So I'll be hosting this evening's discussion and then I'll help facilitate some questions and answers uh, with any time that we have remaining after the presentation. Uh, regarding uh, the questions and answers, you can type your questions in during the presentation by using the little Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, uh, but nothing will actually be answered uh, real time during the presentation. It won't be answered until the end. So uh, you'll need to be somewhat specific in what you're asking about rather than what did that just mean or something like that. Uh, so also um, the topic of this discussion is wildfire preparedness. And we want to respect the time of the people that showed up this evening seeking inform information on preparedness and what they can do to be ready. So we'll be focusing uh, our efforts on answering questions about preparedness and how you can be ready and safe. Uh, I would like to introduce our presenters and then just a little bit more information uh, before we get going. So our primary presenter this evening will be uh, David Cosgrave. Uh, go ahead and give a wave, David. Hello. Beautiful. Um, Chief Cosgrave is a longtime resident and professional firefighter in San Mateo County. He's CAL FIRE's division chief that oversees the day-to-day -day operations of CAL FIRE's cooperative fire protection agreements uh, with San Mateo County Fire and Coastside Fire Protection District. One of Chief Cosgrave's ongoing projects has been the oversight of the Coastal uh, Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT, in San Mateo County, so he's pretty well versed in what uh, he'll be discussing with you all this evening. Our second presenter this evening is Ian Larkin. And uh, Chief Larkin is also, uh, he's a lifelong Santa Cruz County resident and he oversees all administration and operations uh, for CAL FIRE in both San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. So Chief Larkin has been a major driving force in moving toward the Zone Haven evacuation management platform. And we'll be providing his expertise in that area this evening. If I can just get to sharing my screen with y'all here. Hopefully you all should be looking at um, a PowerPoint slide right now and no longer just staring at my face. Uh, it should say ready, set, go on the top. Um, and I wanna take just a brief moment to clear up uh, a little bit of confusion that seems to have arisen out of the series of virtual meetings and webinars that we've been conducting. Um, so the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit of CAL FIRE encompasses both San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. And while the geographical locations may be different, our mission is the same in both counties. And much of our staff reaches out across both counties, like Chief Cosgrave that's uh, joining us in Santa Cruz County tonight from San Mateo County. So while we market information in specific areas sometimes, some of that information reaches across county lines. Uh, and we've been trying to get our message out through all media possible. Uh, but sometimes those miss the mark just a little bit. So we've been trying to offer all of our material in both counties, which I think is where some of the confusion has come through. So uh, if you go back to March 15th and 16th, uh, here in Santa Cruz County, we hosted a couple webinars um, focused on the one on the Bonnie Dune and uh, North Santa Cruz County coast areas, and then one kind of focused on the San Lorenzo Valley. And that was the CZU August Lightning Fire Summary and Lessons Learned. Uh, over the next couple weeks, uh, on April 6th in San Mateo County, we hosted a webinar uh, that was aimed at ready, set, go, wildfire preparedness, being ready when, the time, when uh, that fire comes to you. A couple weeks later, we did, on the 20th, we had a presentation on home hardening and defensible space. And then finally, just a couple weeks ago, we had... Um, uh, another presentation on the CZU August Lightning Fire Summary and Lessons Learned, and that was hosted in San Mateo County. Uh, that's the same presentation that we did uh, in, in March here in Santa Cruz County. There are some little tweaks that we kind of tailored to have the message towards San Mateo County, but by and large, it's the same presentation. Uh, tonight, uh, we'll be having the Ready, Set, Go presentation. 
That's the same one that we had in San Mateo on April 6th. And then in uh, two weeks from tonight, we'll be having the home hardening and defensible space uh, presentation that was previously held in San Mateo County. So in all these, the, sa the message is the same. Uh, the information we're trying to get out is the same. There's just little kind of tweaks uh, that are county specific. So if you missed any of those, uh, then you can find them on Facebook or our YouTube channel. Um, just search CAL FIRE CZU in, that, uh, in either of those platforms and it should get you uh, to where you wanna be. So if I can unshare here, I will get us uh, turned over to Chief Cosgrave and he will get us moving uh, through the bulk of the evening. Chief Cosgrave. Thank you for that. Now I gotta figure out how to share my screen though. So let's see what we go with here. Let's play from the start. You've already saw that one. Um, assuming my volume is good and all that. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Yes, I'm uh, 31 years in the fire service here in San Mateo County, lifelong resident of San Mateo County. And uh, one of my passions in the fire service is getting the community ready for helping themselves because, you know, putting tools in the toolbox is what everyone needs to deal with life, to, uh, life lessons and things like that. And a lot of these skills that I learned when I started teaching preparedness to the CERT groups and all that, um, I had to back up and point out that everyone else doesn't have a lifelong uh, career doing these things. So, you know, breaking it down into steps. So uh, we're going to give you some simple steps, but everything we talk about today is about you doing things and preparing for it. So that's what we're focused on today. And we're going to go over the Ready, Set, Go platform that's out there and uh, Next week, or not, excuse me, not next week, but on May 24th, we'll be doing the more of the ready portion of it. So we're going to have two experts from the uh, John DeLong from South Skyline Fire Safe Council and Ed Hayes from the Fire Safe Council in Santa Cruz County. So people nearer to your hearts, probably uh, on the 24th at six o'clock, they're going to go through a lot of the first part of this presentation that I'm really going to skip over. So I'll give you a, a gist of it to set up the set and go portion, but the nuts and bolts and, and all the, the real uh, gems will come from that webinar. Uh, I'll just go over an overview and prepare you for that and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so how did Ready, Set, Go or RSG because we have to abbreviate everything. How did that get started? Um, in Australia, they have series of wildland fires. Uh, so they had a a program going where they, they wanted to have people uh, leave early or stay and defend. So the stay and defend program had to do with defensible space and hardening their homes. They trained the ranchers and, and the people out there to uh, be able to put firebrands and embers out as they landed on their ranches or near their homes to put them out. Um, they found during evacuations and these large brush fires or bush fires as they call them, uh, they were having injuries and fatalities. So they, they tried letting people stay and defend. Unfortunately, uh, in uh, what they called uh, a Black Saturday firestorm, 173 people died. Uh, what happened was they had you know, several weeks of elevated temperatures, 105 to 115 degrees. Uh, they had over 400 fires going at one time and they had the most critical thing is they had 60 mile an hour winds that just blew the embers and, and the fire too fast for people to defend on themselves. So what we're gonna do in the American version is we're focused on hardening your home, putting defensible space in. We wanna do that in advance. So everything they're gonna teach you next week, we want that in advance so that your home will have a chance of surviving without you there. We want your home to be able to protect itself and we want you out of the area. So we're gonna focus on early evacuation. That's the American version of Ready, Set, Go. Okay, so I just told you what it is. There's uh, four, four portions of it, the defensible space and the home hardening. I added the prevention right there on the handle because I got a little extra time tonight because we're gonna do the lion's share next in two weeks uh, to teach you the home hardening and defensible space. We're going to talk about emergency preparedness and early evacuation. Okay, right here with the ready. So defensible space, that means the area around your home, right? Getting an area that your, your home is protected from heat and, and direct impingement of flame. So that's that portion of it. 
Home hardening refers to what you can do to protect your home from having the embers enter it and have uh, building materials that are resistant to, to catching fire. So the defensible space is the space you have and the hardening of your home is the materials and things you do to keep it from entering there. Uh, you'll probably have seen this, this uh, logo on almost every CAL FIRE uh, pamphlet we put out, puts things into defensible space zones. You got zone one there, which is the first 30 feet by your home and zone two is a hundred feet out. Uh, so these are different buffers and, and different levels you want to create. Again, two weeks from now, they'll go into the, the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, one of the things that's part of the CAL FIRE program is defensible space insp inspections. They come from the public resource code, the our P PRC and the California Code of Regulations and where they're used in the state responsibility areas. So this is something we can go out and inspect properties with and, and, and give to the owners. One thing most people don't understand is it's not to protect the homeowner, it's to protect the wildland. So we can't regulate what you do inside your home and your own preparedness, but uh, uh, they can't get involved trying to protect the wildland and the forest from you. So this is these are in place to try to protect uh, the general public and, and the forest from, from your activities. Okay, so fire tends to go with the wind, tends to go uphill and follow the fuel. So there's certain things you're not gonna be able to, to change. We can't change the weather or the winds. You're pretty much not gonna change the topography you live on, uh, but the fuel, you can interrupt the fuel beds. So they'll talk about uh, minimum clearance of your uh, vegetation and it's all predicated on the amount of slope you have and what's, what direction the fire winds would come from in your area you may have to do adjustments for. We're gonna focus on laddering of fuels. So you have clearance underneath the trees so that uh, we want a fire, if it comes through, we want it to go through, you know, pick up all those minimum leaves and all those things around the ground, not put out a lot of heat, but we don't want it to do is that middle picture there where it goes from the grass to the shrubberies, to the trees, up into the crown of the trees. That's the danger zone. We want to uh, do everything we can to interrupt that. So we'll give you tips on that. Again, with our home hardening, it's the construction materials your home's made with. We want to make sure that there's not a, uh, an entry point that those embers can get into. To get into your house, you see there's a ventilation or vents up on top of the roof. There's eaves, there's gutters, all those places you can imagine that uh, an ember could, uh, could land. The roofing materials. When I selected my home, it was in a, in a flatter area, in a residential area. It was a stucco building, but it was one of two of the last shake roofs on the block. It became the last roof, uh, shake roof on the block when, when the other one caught on fire. So I, I changed my roof and I, you see that's a concrete roof there or a composite roof and, and I put uh, conventional uh, shingles on mine as far as the, uh, the uh, roofing materials. So that's something that was easy to do and it was time to do. Um, so that's one of the things you can do is focus on the materials. If, you're, if you don't have all the materials that they're gonna talk about, you, know, you start in the most critical spots and what you can afford. The vents in your house, you don't want the uh, embers to enter in through uh, broken screens. So they're gonna talk about the mesh. Unfortunately, we can't just close off your house, right? Your house is still gonna need ventilation in the crawl space in the attics, but uh, we wanna make sure it's only air that gets in there and your eaves and the overhangs, all these places that you can protect from, from things accumulating. And then those, those gutters, you wanna cover them so organic material doesn't build up there, okay? Dual pane windows, if a fire was to burn by your house uh, and it was all protected, one of the things that could happen if you don't have dual pane windows of good quality, if you have lightweight uh, draperies or anything inside of the house, the radiant heat could catch them on fire. So. They're gonna talk about having heavier shutters or just removing those if there's a fire and having dual pane windows because uh, the dual pane has a, a, a section of insulation in between them. The air gap helps protect that radiant heat from coming into your home. Okay, and then there's all kinds of material listings. You can look at the building material listings online and get different type of fire ratings for whatever kind of project you're working on your home. Again, the Fire Safe Council experts in two weeks will have all that. There. So it's a combination of both the defensible space of clearing the vegetation and uh, preparing your home 
that's going to give your house a chance of surviving. And again, we want that house to survive without you. You know, one of the tips they're going to tell you, and, and if you've got a wooden fence that goes from, you know, the field to your house, somewhere in that wooden fence, you want an interruption so that the fence doesn't smolder and travel all the way up to your, uh, your house and catch your house on fire, right? You don't want the fire to burn through a field. Nobody's there. Nobody sees it or they can't get resources to it because there's too much going on. And that fire just uh, crawls through the fence until it gets to your home. So any kind of uh, gate that you can put on there that could be fireproof or any kind of interruptions in the, in the surface, that'll help you. So you wanna make that house defendable on its own. Okay, so tonight we're gonna focus on what I love and that's what you can do. All right, so sorry about these slides. I put these on so they're a little bit different format and probably spelled wrong and they, they uh, develop a diff little differently than the regular ones. But uh, on the hot, windy, dry days, you know, you never wanna use a power mower because they could, they could create sparks, whether it's from the hot equipment itself or, or chipping a rock or some kind of metal debris starts the vegetation on fire. Uh, you don't want wood or other outdoor burning during this period because all it takes is one ember from that to go into the, uh, the fuel and, and then we're off to the races with the fire. Um, we've had several fires that have started from grease fires and barbecues or barbecues that are uh, in the wind event to blow over. Same thing with the discarded smoking materials. We've had a fire where the, the cigarette can or the butt can uh, blew over and, and started a fire. So. Again, on these windy days, that's when you really have to be uh, watching critically on what, what you're doing. Never want to pull your vehicle over in the grass, connect deck into your catalytic converter. Could be hot, underside of your car hot, and catch any of the grass or vegetation on fire. And properly maintaining your vehicle uh, to prevent materials from being spit out of your catalytic converter system. Uh, one thing people uh, have been had these fires start, they noticed a, a uh, diminishing power from their car or the car sputtering, not running right. They wanted to stretch it out a little bit longer before they sold the car or fixed the car, whatever it was. And then they were driving for some distance and uh, it broke down. And then they saw behind them that they had started a fire because when the, the catalytic converter uh, disintegrated, it was uh, shooting out hot embers. And I'll show you some pictures of what they look like in the next slide. Another thing that happens mostly on the interstates, uh, is the trucks and trailers uh, carrying chains. If you let that chain drag on the ground, it could produce a spark, it could fly into the wildland. And there's uh, interstate fires, highway fires that start with that. Um, we've had the incidents of people doing uh, target shooting uh, during dry times in grass. We've had people doing the gender reveals and the pyrotechnic reveals and, and all those types of things are, are, are human caused and 100% preventable are avoidable, preventable, and we try to do that all the time. The other thing is the reason we have that uh, prevention inspections or what we call the LE 100s is prevent house fires. If your house catches on fire, we don't want that to carry to the wildland. So the best way to prevent that is to be safe in your home, right? Have your smoke detectors, have extinguishers, have your wiring in good condition, uh, make sure everybody's safe with everything they're doing that produces heat and, and with fire. So. You know, candles when the power goes out. During these red flag warnings, we might have power outages we'll talk about. So you wanna make sure you use uh, lighting. Don't, don't ever use any kind of uh, heating equipment indoors that's not properly ventilated, all those types of things. So you need to be safe in everything you do. This is uh, Highway 1 in San Mateo County. That's not smoke that you see up on top if that's coming through your picture good enough, but uh, it's a foggy day and a catalytic converter that failed, spit out the slag into this field. Uh, you can see there's some burn marks there. This next picture, that's some, those are some uh, remnants of the slag that went into the material. As you can see on the left-hand top, you can see the material around it is a little bit burnt. It didn't actually start the fire. It started a minimal spread, uh, but other ones were in more receptive fuel beds and they caught on fire. So uh, you know, when we're thinking about hardening on our home, we're thinking about that ember storm that's gonna come, uh, whether it's from heat that's lofting the embers to you or the wind that's blowing embers at you. We don't want those burning embers that are still hot to land in the receptive fuel bed and start the fire. 
So these are all things we can do to prevent that. So ve vegetation clearance, the top picture, you see a eucalyptus tree there that has is clean underneath. It's got some succulents around it and some grass, but that's, uh, that's good separation that uh, it won't climb as much. On the bottom left, that's maybe a, a year's worth of bark and debris falling off of it. And on the bottom right, that's an area that needs to be cleaned out. That's an area that the fire would carry through uh, very easily and, and burn very hot. So, so it's incumbent on everybody to any, any properties they own to clear, clear the vegetation as much as they can, limb up as much as they can so it doesn't climb. But the ground fuel is the most important thing because that's where the fire usually carries the most. Okay, and when you're doing that, I should tell you to wear gloves and be careful because there's probably gonna be rats and things uh, living in here. But uh, don't forget if you have saddles in the trees, the embers aren't just gonna learn, land on the ground, but they're gonna, they're gonna land up in those saddles. So you wanna look up and uh, clear out those materials as well. Okay, and now we're into the set portion. Okay, we're gonna prepare your home to have an evacuation plan. That means having a checklist and, uh, and what you're gonna take uh, when you're evacuating and be ready to implement your plan. Now, a lot of people say that they have a plan, but when's the last time you uh, went through it and when's the last time you practiced it? So it's a good review for everybody. Your evacuation plan, you know, what should I wear? I'm not kidding about that. We'll talk about what you wear. Everyone needs to dress for success during an evacuation. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Your disaster kit supplies. No matter what the disaster is, you should have a, a go bag, whether it's an earthquake, tsunami, flood, uh, for whatever reason you have to, to go, you need to have your kit ready. Uh, and it doesn't change much for a fire evacuation. A communications plan. Test the plan, do this whole thing and run it through with your family and do it in the dark because most likely you're gonna be without power when the, when the time comes. And hopefully it's not at night, but uh, it might be so dark you think it's night. Okay, when you're making your plan, there's six Ps. So remember, you need to plan for people and pets. And the pets are a big deal. One thing you wanna do is take care of the pets early. Make sure you have a carrier or a crate uh, make sure you get those pets early. You don't want to have to be looking for them at the end. They're going to sense you're amped up. They're going to sense something wrong, uh, is wrong. They're going to be spooked and they're going to be acting differently. So uh, make sure you get your pets in the crates early and make sure you do the same with the people. Everyone in your household and that you're caring for is going to be uh, spooked and, and ready to go. Uh, depending on the abilities of the people in your home and yourself, that's going to be a, a more planning and, uh, and more work for you when the time comes. You want to keep your papers, your phone numbers, your important documents, uh, prescriptions, eyeglasses, all those things you want to replace or you can't replace, but you can use. Uh, anything that's irreplaceable, the memorabilia, anything you can pack, your personal computer and hard drives. It says plastic, which is your credit card, ATM cards, and cash. You wanna make sure you grab your passport. Well, I wanna have your vaccination card with you now, right? They need to add that one to it. Uh, one of our captains who uh, works in Santa Cruz County, uh, he had a home in, still has a home, but he, he lived in paradise during the fires in paradise. I, he had, I had to cancel an overtime because he was working there in San Mateo County at the time. Felt bad that we had training that got canceled, which canceled his opportunity to work. So he, he was home that day. Uh, the good thing is he was home because if he wasn't, uh, the fire would have burned through without him there. But uh, fate had it that uh, he was home the day before the fire started. So that morning, he heard what he thought was rain. He went outside and he saw uh, not burning numbers, but ash and things coming from the sky. I kind of knew what was up and started packing up the cars. They packed up two cars with all their materials. Uh, fire started getting closer and, and he decided that he was going to park one car in the driveway away from the house, away from any kind of burn, uh, vegetation in the hopes that it would survive. He had his family, his pets, and the most important things with him. And they evacuated in one car because it was safer to stay together. Unfortunately, he lost the house and he lost the car, but everything important to him, uh, he took with him and he's back in place in, in paradise again. So. You want to make sure you keep what's important, most important to you ready to go. 
and uh, do, do your best to, to get out in a quick manner because you don't have a lot of time when that evacuation order is given. Okay, other places you can uh, get information to, to get ready. There's several things online that can help you. This is the Ready, Set, Go or www.ready.gov. You can get information there and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the CERT teams. You have the Santa Cruz County CERT.org that can get you in touch with the local CERT teams in Santa Cruz County. And here's some for South Skyline, La Honda and Coastside by me. So you wanna make sure you uh, get in touch with them because that's a big thing they focus on is the getting in touch, knowing your neighbors, right? If you have to evacuate, it's good to know your neighbor or um, you know, get, get that plan together for your neighborhood so you can all uh, get together and, and uh, reunite outside of the zone and you can say, we checked on our neighbors and everyone's is out safely and you can account for people remotely. So you wanna build a network within your own neighborhoods and CERT teams are usually a good place to, uh, to build that network. Okay, another thing uh, here is building your communication plan. You, know, you wanna have the out of area contact person and where you would meet, you need to make the plan for whether you're at work or at home which way the fire is coming from, you know, you try to keep it simple, but there's a lot of uh, variabilities, right? We don't know uh, which way the fire is coming from, where you're going to be. If you have neighbors that can share information, that's great. And one of the tips I give to the CERT members is whether the fire hits you or the evacuation hits you, if it's getting bad and ugly in the area you're at, it might be the best time to just, you know, protect your home with what you can to get it ready so you can leave. And, and go far away, as, as far away, if you know a uh, hotel, you know, two hours away that has a place where it's got uh, a pool and Wi-Fi, it's gonna be much more comfortable there because you're not gonna be sleeping in the area that if you try to remain behind. <clears throat> and those hotels will fill, fill up fast when the evacuation orders come. So uh, be proactive and, and uh, maybe get a couple nights away from home if you need it. Monitoring the weather. Chief Larkin is gonna talk about the Zone Haven platform and evacuation warnings, but I'm gonna teach you and tell you mostly about uh, maintaining your situational awareness. If you've lived in this area, you know the nights that we get coastal fog, you get that uh, moisture that comes in that usually protects us from these wildland fires. Well, you also know the days when the wind has changed and it's dry. You know those days you wake up in the morning and there's no dew on the ground, the, everything's still dry. So, so those are the times you can, you know the weather's changed. You don't need to look at the weatherman here telling you there's a red flag warning, but uh, there's several broadcasts that go out. Anytime there's a weather warning, they, they, it's on television, it's on every uh, social media. Um, so, but uh, those nights, those nights and those days when there is a red flag warning, Maintain your situational awareness. Keep your phones, cell phones on loud. Several areas where there were evacuations, people found that they silenced their phone at, phone at night because they didn't want the uh, unwanted texts coming through and all those things. They had turned their phones off or down and did not hear the warnings. So uh, you, especially on red flag warnings, you want to keep those phones on. And again, with the situational awareness, if you're in the area where the fire starts, there might not be time for the uh, evacuation orders to get to you. <clears throat> the fire service might not even get to your area before the fire is on you. So, you know, keep, keep your keep your uh, situational awareness up. Okay, I, I joked earlier said we were going to talk about what you should wear. You're not going to look like this crew captain here. Well, maybe you will, but uh, everything he's wearing there. You know, we got to protect our hair. When we talk about the grass and the, the flashy fuels, you know, the last thing you want is that heat burning your face or the back of your your uh, neck or an ember landing in your hair, right? So you 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 want to have a hat. You if you can get goggles, put goggles on. You're protecting your nose and your mouth with a. Uh, well, we we all have probably masks around now with the pandemic. So again. It, just like you've learned with the pandemic, if you get an N95 or higher, it's harder to work because it's hard to breathe. So you have to judge that whether it's just gonna be a scarf to filter out some of the smoke, uh, but you will want something to protect your, your respiratory system from the smoke as much as you can. Uh, your neck, your arms, your, your body legs, right? You wanna have shoes that you can, you can move in. 
and you want long sleeve shirts even on a hot summer day you want long pants even on a hot summer day when you're doing evacuation you know you never want to wet any of the materials you put around your face if you get a blast of heat that hot that wet material will turn to steam if you inhale the steam then you would have a respiratory problem because of steam burns so you're better off to have a dry material that's going to shield you just from the the uh, radiant heat and, and move on now a headlamp that's something very good you want to have when you're doing your evacuation and planning and, and getting and getting ready if you're trying to pack things in the dark when the power goes out you can only do so much holding your phone and uh using the flashlight on that a headlamp goes everywhere your eyes go and you don't have to worry about it so one of those headlamps you can get from a local hardware store or any of the chain stores they're they're gold for for trying to free your hands and work and drinking water have water in your car have water in the house because you're gonna it's gonna be hot you're gonna be panting your good heart's gonna be racing and you're gonna get dehydrated so you want to make sure you have the endurance to to uh, to get set and go I talked a little bit about the uh, PG&E power safety shutdowns uh, when the lines when PG&E built the lines out there was nothing in place that said we were going to be shutting down power to these areas when um, when the weather changed and the winds were blowing. So it's taken a while to put new technology and infrastructure in and they've done a lot of improvements, but what they look for is, you know, they get a, a report of uh, severe weather, it's forecasted, then they put out the uh, thing that a, uh, a public safety power shutdown watch, meaning that's likely the warning means that there's gonna be the outage and then it goes down to the, pa the power shutoff and they can't turn the power back on. This is the frustrating part, that blue portion there. They can't turn the power back on until they've inspected every line on that system. So the, in the past, when they did it at the beginning, shutting off that one switch was easy. Trying to get the power back on to their entire line was more difficult. So they've done a lot of improvements. I'll show you the next slide here. This is a Canyon Road. The picture on the left, I guess they're both the same thing, but the picture on the left is a uh, uh, some switches. The picture on the right is a, a weather station that's taking wind uh, measurements and PG now can, can remotely shut down that canyon. So whether they're shutting off only that canyon or if they shut off the grid for a long portion of, of line, they can keep that portion shut off, uh, get the main line inspected and canyon by canyon start to turn the power back on. So that's made for more efficient and quicker uh, restoration of power for inspecting the lines. Again, the more remote you are and the more line there is between you and, and the major circuit, the longer it's gonna take for them to get back on. But these are improvements that have been put in place throughout California through pg and &E's sections. All right, so if the power is out in your area and you need to evacuate, Hopefully you know how to open your garage door if your car is stuck behind that door. It's done by pulling the release cable on the pulley. It's a little red deal in the center. I think my mouse does there. It's right there. You pull that down. It pulls the spring here, and then you can manually lift, manually lift the door back up. Pull your car out, and then you want to put it back into place and shut the door because you don't want to leave that door open where uh, embers can enter your garage. Okay, which one of these are you? I'm hoping everybody's that person that's backed in because most first responders, you know, police, fire, ambulances, the last thing we wanna do when we get an emergency call is have to take the time to back out and then start going forward. So it's much safer. When you come driving into an area, you've been driving for a while, you have more spatial awareness of your vehicle. So it's usually safer for you and less accidents if you drive, if you back in at that time versus in, if you're gonna back out when it's wet out or if you've got a smoking environment, you don't have windshield and wiper on the back of your vehicle or as, as good as on the front, your visibility will be less. So you wanna back in when it's safe to do so. <clears throat> I made the comment uh, on the last webinar I did that I, I back into my garage. It's because I have a, a garage that doesn't have a, a person door to the house. Uh, and someone said, well, what about uh, carbon monoxide poisoning? So. Definitely outside and it's your decision on whether you want to back into your garage, maybe on red flag warning days, you might want to back into your garage. Uh, but if you have a, 
uh, a door that opens right up to your kitchen and you've got a car that's running rough and you you definitely don't want to idle it in the garage, but quick in and out with the door open to, to ventilate some of the exhaust, you'll have to make that decision on your own, uh, but it's best to back in. Okay, so on the set portion, you got to be set for day or night. Know where your keys are. Don't misplace them. If you're that person that always loses your keys, then you know when you're in a panic, when you're gathering your pets, you're chasing down your kids, you're trying to find where you left that uh, wedding picture and album, whatever it's going to be. You've got a million things going through your mind. You can smell the smoke. You can hear the fire engines. Somebody's telling you've got to go right now. The last thing you want to do is have your keys locked in your car or lost somewhere in the house. So don't misplace your keys and plan for it to be done in the dark with no electricity. I couldn't really word this one right, but uh, you cannot pack time. So you can't, you can't store time. The only place you can... Uh, make time up is, is getting ready and in the set mode. Because when it's time to go, it's time to go. There's, you, can't, you can't phone a friend, you can't do anything. It's just you and the clock. So you need to get moving and get out. And once you're gone, you're gonna be out for days, right? If you've got a large scale evacuation, they have, law enforcement has to cordon off that area and they can't, they can't just let everybody back in for this reason or that reason, because there's a huge area with a lot of, lot of residents and, and everybody has a, a reason to get back in and, and they just don't have the manpower and the resources to do that. We had hundreds of people who were trying to do it during the uh, CZU uh, roadblocks we had here in San Mateo County. I, you know, I felt bad for one person who was on a work trip when the fire came in and everything he needed for his employment and for his work was back at his home in the evacuated area, but they just couldn't couldn't let them in to do that until the roadblocks were dropped. So they have to deny entry to everybody, protect them, and you wouldn't want somebody being let back into your neighborhood unattended. So you got to think about the masses and unfortunately, a legitimate reason uh, can't be accommodated all the time. Now we're in the go portion of it. This one gets me. This is the simplest step, go. Kind of threw me for a reason for, for a minute, but uh, That'd be the end of this uh, series if that was the truth, but uh, it's the simplest step if you've done everything before it, right? Your, your home is ready to stand by itself or to stand the best chance because you've got good clearance between the vegetation, you've cleaned up the gutters and all the things are gonna teach you next in two weeks on the 24th and, uh, and, and now you're, you're ready to go. So you can see this picture here, I talked about panic, right? That, that, that woman in this neighborhood, this neighborhood looks like it's completely in a panic. That car's blocked in by another car on the roadway. Now they're gonna play Jenga trying to get everybody in and out. There's cars, you know, hatchbacks that are open. They're not backed in. So to avoid that panic, look, prepare and be ready to go. By leaving early, not only does it help your stress level, not only is it gonna make it a lot easier for you, uh, it's gonna help firefighters by clearing the roads, right? We're, the fire department and other emergency responders are gonna be trying to get in while you're getting out. And we can't start perimeter defense. We can't start or perimeter control. We can't start uh, structure defense until everybody's out. So we need you to help us by getting out so we can get in there and do the work we need to do. The roads are gonna be congested. Uh, so we need to be able to move. And again, I can't stress enough that leaving early, uh, you might think you're going too early, but you'll be so thankful you did because if you wait for this moment, uh, it's, it's a heartache for everybody and it's hard on everybody. And some people you know, don't handle pressure as much as other people. So if you're uh, emotional on a, on a day-to-day -day level, just imagine what you're gonna be here. And again, use that to prepare. Okay, going early, leaving early, especially if you have large animals, you want to get a hold of the large animal evacuation group in your area. You want to make sure that you have areas for them. <clears throat> and that's a whole specialty in itself. Uh, there's probably a large animal evac group with you. There's one in San Mateo County that's very active that moved you know, hundreds of animals to the cow palace. And so you want to have that plan in place and get in touch with the, your local groups. Okay, evacuate yourself, what to do if, if trapped. Okay, so you, you didn't listen to me on the ready and the set portion and now going is a problem. 
That whole thing about being the easiest step is no longer the truth. This picture here with the embers coming across the roadway, that could be day or that could be night. We don't know, but that's that's about the that's good visibility that you might have. Okay, you can see there there's a truck stuck in the roadway up ahead of them, whatever they were trying to do. But that's what you're going to face if you don't go early. So the longer you wait, the more obstacles you're going to face. The less options you're going to have, the higher risk, obviously. The mental stress, much more. The visibility you're going to go through. Traffic, the blockages, you know, so um, routes that you would have taken early might have accidents on them and now you're that route is not open to you. So you want to leave early. Okay. If you're not even in your car and you're trapped in your uh, chateau or, you know, if you're, you, if you're trapped, there's, there's definitely no safe options, right? You want to shelter away from the outside walls. You want to put wet towels under the doors, right? Again, just like we said, when you're, you don't want any wet materials by your face. This would only be down on the floor to keep the smoke from coming through the floor and keep it a little more tenable. You want to close all the doors in the house. You want to patrol for spot fires, right? You don't know where the fire is going to come into that house as the fire front's burning through. Have extinguishers so you can put anything out. Maybe uh, uh, one of the curtains you didn't take down starts to catch on fire. You can put out a small fire while it's small. Be aware above you and below you, right? The fire can get into your attic. The fire can get into the crawl space. If you have a wooden deck, the wooden deck's probably gonna catch on fire and it's gonna burn its way up to your house. So be aware of, of the vulnerabilities you have at your house. Uh, and then once the fire, if the fire front passes you, you wanna check for embers and put out what you can and, and make it a saveable save space. Once the house does catch on fire, if it's, you know, you, you have to get out. So whatever side, you're really out of options there. So whatever side there's uh, the least amount of fuel, that's where you would want to go with all those materials we had you dressed in. You would have to go outside, probably towards the front, front towards the roadway, but it depends on the winds, it depends on the fire activity. So you would be want to keep, make, keep your uh, uh, situational awareness up, even when you're in that situation. Okay, if you're in your car, again, no safe options. You've got the long sleeves on, you've got clo you know, clothing on, maybe you have a, a, a heavy wool blanket or something you can put over you if, so if there's heat coming. But uh, if you're trapped in your car, there's large turnouts, maybe you can protect yourself from the burning vegetation, cul-de-sacs, parking lots, green belts, golf courses, meadows, pastures, lawns, horse stables, areas where the animals have grazed, any place that's low on fuel that won't burn and, and depending on the, the wind direction. You wanna have your windows up. You wanna put your air on recirculate. That's the one that's the little arrow that goes around in a circle in most cars. So you don't wanna have the cabin air coming in from the outside. You wanna just keep the air from within your car. You wanna park away from any kind of green fuels that will burn. Uh, park away from draws, right? So if you're at the top of a canyon uh, and you can see the vegetation on both sides of the canyon going down, you're right in that chute. That's going to be a natural place where the fire is going to want to come up. So you don't want to park at the top of a draw of a canyon. Keep your hazard lights and all the lights on in your car. Um, protect yourself from smoke and heat with a blanket. You can get down low in the car. Again, You'll, you will not run out the outrun the fire. So whatever you can do to shield yourself from, from the heat is what you need to do. So why ready, set, go? It's a consistent message used by fire departments across the nation. The International Association of Fire Chiefs uh, endorse it. And I'll see if this works. It's going to work. Here's, here's the official ready, set, go. The massive wildfire exploded early Thursday morning, burning nearly 25,000 acres. 
Station Fire has forced new evacuations this morning. The fire moved up a ridge line and then caught the Santa Ana winds perfectly. In the summer of 2008, nearly 2,000 lightning spark wildfires scorched over a million acres across California, destroying hundreds of structures and impacting the lives in the surrounding communities forever. I never thought it was going to happen to me. Um, you know, you always figure it's the other guy that's going to get their house burned. And with California's Mediterranean climate, another fire siege of that magnitude is just a matter of time. I'm Cal Fire's Daniel Berlant. Devastating wildfires occur every year across the state, putting lives, property, and the state's natural resources at a constant threat. In California, wildfires aren't a question of if, but only a question of when. If you choose to live near a natural area of the state, you are at risk for wildfires, and it's your responsibility to prepare yourself, your family, and your home. And that preparation starts with three simple steps. Ready, set, go. Getting ready before wildfire happens is a vital first step in protecting yourself and your property. Beginning in the spring months, well before the peak of fire season, you should carefully assess your property and start taking steps to prepare for the hotter months to come. As firefighters are responding to fires throughout California, one of the most important things they can look for is defensible space. Defensible space is the required 100 feet between your property and the surrounding wildland area. Defensible space has consistently been shown to be the best, most practical first line of defense for your home against wildfires. Adequate defensible space provides a barrier to slow, or in some cases even halt, the progress of fire that would otherwise engulf your property. It also helps ensure the safety of firefighters while they defend your home. I'm going to have to go to homes that provide some type of clearance for my firefighters. I cannot go to a home that needs, um, has brush and everything growing right up to it. I've got to pick a home where I can safely make a stand and if we get stuck there that we can survive it as well. When the destructive lightning siege fires burned throughout California in 2008, defensible space once again proved to be a key element around the homes that survived while many homes without adequate clearance were not as fortunate. But defensible space isn't the only factor in protecting your property. Another critical step is hardening your home. During a wildfire, loose flying embers can find weak points on the outside of your home. Hardening your home means reinforcing these vulnerabilities. Cal Fire Battalion Chief Nick Schuler demonstrates some of the components of a well-defended home. As you see here, they have an excellent green belt around their home. All of their trees are limbed up so there's no dead and dying vegetation around their home. And as you can see, as we walk along, all the leaf litter has been picked up and we move straight into the fire-resistant construction. They have the stucco siding. They have the enclosed eaves and the composite roof, all proactive steps that this homeowner has taken to reduce fire potential. Now that you have your home ready for a wildfire, it's time to get set by preparing your most valuable assets, your life and the lives of your family. You should start by creating a wildfire action plan. A wildfire action plan gives you and your family a chance to plan out and write down important information and special preparations that you'll need to take as a wildfire approaches. As part of your wildfire action plan, you want to sit down with your family and talk about things like escape routes, uh, what roads are you going to take when you leave the house, and the other thing is where are you going to go. You want to have a meeting location. Your family's plan will be unique depending on your circumstances, so it's vital that you practice and update it regularly to keep everybody prepared. It's also important to plan which belongings in your house you'll need to take with you in case of evacuation if you have time. Prepare what you're going to take with you when you leave. There's nothing worse than packing up to leave and you realize you didn't take anything that you really wanted to. You took stuff that just was the first thing you saw. Wildfires can move quickly and can change direction into a surrounding community without warning. With the assurance that your home is now well defended and your family's wildfire action plan in place, when a wildfire approaches, you're now ready to go. During a wildfire, emergency personnel may not be able to warn everybody, so it's up to you to take the initiative to stay informed by listening to the TV or radio for announcements. If an evacuation is imminent, it's time to set your wildfire action plan into motion. Don't wait to be ordered to leave your residence, just go, and go early. 
By leaving early, you give your family the best chance of surviving a wildfire. Follow the directions of fire and law enforcement, and if you feel threatened, you need to go ahead and get out of that home. We have a lot of systems in place to notify you of that, but you have to be willing to get out and get out early. Although wildfires can be unpredictable, destructive, and deadly, they're an undeniable part of California's wildland. Wildfire is coming, and it's the steps you take now that will ensure you, your family, and your home have a fighting chance when it happens. For more information on how to prepare for wildfires and for a wildfire action plan checklist, visit readyforwildfire.org. I always have a hard time ending the video, but uh, uh, that website, readyforwildfire.org, has lots of information, a lot of things we covered tonight, and you'll cover in two weeks from now on the 24th. Uh, so that's the portion of, of that I'm taking care of. Uh, Unit Chief Ian Larkin is going to cover the zone haven on the, on the go portion of it. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen as soon as I find that. There it is. Now we're back. All right, let me uh, get my side going here. Um, so I think you all should be able to see a single slide with uh, the evacuation. Dave, you seeing that? Yeah, I just muted okay. myself. Let's go. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, so good evening. Uh, my name is Ian Larkin. I'm the unit chief here uh, in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. Um, and as uh, Chief Armstrong uh, mentioned, um, I have been working pretty diligently uh, to bring a new management uh, evacuation management platform to both San Mateo and Santa Cruz County over the last couple of years. And uh, we have embarked in an uh, agreement with a company called Zone Haven uh, to bring this new uh, evacuation management platform uh, uh, to you, the citizens, to hope uh, to have better information for you on uh, what is happening during a fire or any other type of emergency that may require an evacuation. Um, so what we're gonna cover tonight is evacuation notification systems. Uh, we're gonna cover Zone Haven. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Code Red, which is the Santa Cruz County uh, Reverse 911 system, uh, as well as just briefly on the San Mateo County uh, alerts or SMC alerts. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit about wireless emergency alerts and then also the Alert Wildfire Camera um, uh, website uh, where you can actually see and view uh, uh, cameras that uh, would provide uh, uh, vital information in the event of a uh, wildland fire. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the uh, emergency uh, alert, uh, wireless emergency alert system, which is called WIA. Um, so WIA is a public uh, uh, safety system that allows customers uh, who own compatible mobile devices uh, to receive um, uh, geographically targeted information uh, like a text message, uh, alerting them to uh, imminent threats uh, to the safety in the area that you're physically in. Uh, so this uh, basically uses cell towers and things in that general area uh, to be able to send out uh, this alert um, to tell you, hey, something's wrong, uh, you need to be aware of it, and you may need to leave the area uh, that you're in. Um, this is a uh, uh, kind of a last resort or uh, in the instance of where people may not have uh, um, good communication uh, would be something that would be used uh, to alert those folks in England and areas that have uh, poor or no communication uh, in, the, in the wildland areas of, uh, of the community. Um, this is a, uh, a system that the government uh, authority uh, having jurisdiction uh, may send uh, alerts regarding public safety emergencies. Um, such as severe weather, a missing child, uh, or um, if you need to evacuate. Uh, so for some examples, uh, in the wintertime, you may, if you live in a flood prone area, you may get flash flood warnings from the National Weather Service. Uh, those are coming over that wireless emergency alert, or if you're getting an amber alert uh, that you may uh, receive where you're on the highway where your phone makes a really obnoxious noise. Those are those WIA alerts that you're getting. Um, and then, uh, you receive uh, these messages on mobile devices based on uh, the location uh, or area that you're in, as I stated earlier. <clears throat> uh, these alerts uh, will be uh, received by basically any WIA capable device. Uh, 
pretty much if you have a modern cell phone or a smartphone, um, you should be able to receive these devices, but it's always good to check with your wireless carrier uh, to make sure that uh, that service is included uh, when you purchase that phone. Uh, but for the most part, uh, everybody uh, should be able to receive those, but it's always good to just double check. Um, there's no need to sign up for these uh, alerts. Um, they're automatically uh, available, it's free, and it's a nationwide service. So no matter where you're at uh, in the nation, uh, or whatever city you're in, uh, if they send out a WIA alert, you should receive it if your uh, device is capable of that. Uh, and then there's a website you can go uh, to get some additional information on the WIA alerts, and it's basically the FCC uh, site. Um, there's an address here uh, in the slide. I won't read it out for you, but I'll give you a second if you want to take a snapshot of that or a picture, and this also will be available in the presentation uh, that you can view on YouTube as well. So let's talk a little bit, uh, something near and dear to my heart is Zone Haven. So Zone Haven is uh, basically an evacuation management platform uh, that is used to quickly communicate to the public about emergency uh, status of the uh, local area. Um, fortunately, uh, during the CZU Lightning Complex, um, we were able, we, we didn't quite have the system up and running, but we were able to uh, talk with Zone Haven and they uh, immediately uh, jumped into action and brought the system up live. And we were able to use this during the CZU Lightning uh, Complex uh, to help us manage the evacuations of over 77,000 people uh, in the two counties. Uh, San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties are basically broken into hundreds of different zones. And uh, each of these zones um, are unique. Um, they have uh, a, a unique naming convention, which we'll cover a little bit later. Um, and it's really important uh, uh, to know your zone. Uh, we've taken uh, some really uh, precise uh, uh, metrics to, to build these zones and make sure that they uh, work for the community and then they work for the uh, both law enforcement and fire departments. Um, so um, a couple different things, evacuation orders involve many different agencies uh, and it usually spans over multiple, multiple jurisdictions. Uh, down to the, the, the bare, bare basics of all this, um, law enforcement has the uh, specific authority to uh, initiate and order evacuations, but in a collaborative effort, uh, the fire department works hand in hand and uh, makes a lot of the recommendations uh, that law enforcement agencies will enact uh, in those zones. Uh, what Zone Haven does is Zone Haven allows us to work on the same platform um, uh, at the same time uh, to make sure these evacuations uh, are coordinated between the emergency crews and the public. Um, it's really allowed us to have that collaboration uh, where we're not sitting down on the hood of a truck drawing on maps of where we're going to evacuate. It's already pre-designated. And when we talk about planning, this is what we have done as uh, emergency services providers, is we have put a plan in place uh, that we are practicing and working very diligently to make sure that in the event that we ever had to order these evacuations, that we're ready to go. <clears throat> Each of these zones um, uh, include data about those specific communities. Um, so as you uh, uh, learn to know your zone, you'll be able to click on that zone and uh, it will bring up specific data about that community or that specific zone uh, and the status of that zone. So the first step in our preparation, um, in order to understand whether your area is under evacuation uh, warning or an order, you need to know your zone's name. So as I said, each of these zones have a unique uh, naming convention. So um, uh, the fire service kind of developed these zones. So uh, we're utilizing all of the fire agencies uh, or county uh, designator. Uh, so for example, uh, in San Mateo County, um, it, it may be SMC uh, with a dash and then an E and then a series of numbers uh, and then potentially another letter behind that. So uh, it's really important to know what that zone is. So um, authorities use the zone uh, uh, naming convention in all of our media releases and all of our social media posts. So whenever we do an evacuation, um, that's how we're gonna tell people what zone is being evacuated. We're gonna use that specific naming convention to notify residents uh, uh, which are under an evacuation warning or an order. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, precisely about uh, what the order and uh, understanding of how uh, to understand what a warning is versus an order. Um, you can find your zone name um, at this website, it's https colon forward slash forward slash 
community.zonehaven.com. And I'm going to try something here real quick. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to click on this screen. And now I'm going to share my screen again. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, you should see a blue screen here, and uh, basically this blue screen um, is where you can uh, learn to know your zone. And basically, if you come down here where my cursor is and it says find your zone, you can doesn't click on like that. Up, Chief. What's that? Sorry about that. It doesn't look like it's up. It didn't come up? No. Um, let me double check here. It's blue on my side, so. Okay, how about now? Now you're looking good. All right, sorry about that technology. I, you, doesn't matter how much you use it, it always gives you a problem. So um, you go down here to this uh, area where it says find your zone now, and you can click on this, and it's gonna start the Zone Haven application. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm just gonna move the map around a little bit here. Um, you can see a, a bunch of these zones that have these little naming conventions in here and stuff. It's not really important to know that, you can just type in your address. So I'm just going to type in the current address that I'm located at right now. Um, I can spell it and help. <clears throat> Got the big nine in there. Um, so this is basically our Cal Fire headquarters, and you can see it automatically takes me to that zone. Um, I can see here that that zone name is FEL E. 003B, uh, and the reason it's got so many numbers and letters in there is uh, this is also part of the debris flow after the fire, so it's a split zone. So it's part of zone three, but it has a, uh, uh, a split in it. That's why it gets that alpha character at the end. But um, so you can click down here on the police information and fire information. It'll tell you who the authority uh, that is in that jurisdiction, um, and then uh, it'll give you some additional information. So what I'm gonna do though, is I'm gonna click on the little highlighted area here. Um, and so this is gonna give me some additional information about that zone. So as you can see, that zone is uh, FEL-E003C, uh, is in Charlie. And it tells you a little bit more information about it. So that, that zone is currently under an advisory. Um, and that advisory is because of there's a debris flow uh, information. So if I click on that debris flow information, it'll take me to another uh, site takes me to the County of Santa Cruz's website that talks about the brief flow and the hazards associated with that. So that's that information uh, sheet that you'll, uh, you'll see when you go in there. So it's easy enough to go up and, uh, and, and click on that uh, um, search button, type in your address, and it should take you to the zone uh, that you uh, are. Um, you can also do a little bit of uh, uh, searching here uh, related to fires. Uh, and it'll give you some information specifically to fire. So I'm just gonna click on the first one I see here. Um, it's the Freedom Fire that occur occurred back in uh, January of this year. Um, and that fire occurred down in the uh, Watsonville area. And if I click on that fire, it's gonna give me a little bit of information uh, on what that fire. So a little bit of fire history uh, goes along with this evacuation uh, management platform. So let me stop sharing here and I'll try to go back to all right. Okay, we should be back to the uh, step one presentation. Uh, so our preparation. So that's the Zone Haven uh, platform. So. What I can say is once you've found your zone, uh, it's really important that you remember that. So it's important to write that down and post it somewhere so it's easily accessible to you. Uh, put it in your notes in your phone uh, or, or just commit it to memory. It's, um, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to remember uh, the three letter identifier and uh, in what zone you're in. Um, and each of those are gonna be unique to the fire agency uh, that provides you fire protection. So for example, in Santa Cruz County, um, if you are in the Boulder Creek Fire Protection District, um, that zone would start out with BOU because that's Boulder Creek Fire Protection District's uh, three-letter identifier for that fire agency. 
and then each of us uh, that uh, are responsible for fire, for fire protection uh, have an agency with that uh, three letter event. So let's go to the next part. So as I said, know your zone. Uh, I'll leave this up for just a second. These are a couple of different websites where you can actually go. Um, and, and the one we were just at was the uh, community. Um, zone Haven. Um, and the My Zone is the one you can go and get more information about the entire platform uh, and how it works and operates um, in more detail. So, in the event of a wildfire or an emergency situation, uh, our law enforcement partners and our fire agencies. Uh, issue evacuation warnings or orders um, that that are needed for an, an impacted area. Uh, these notices uh, are used um, uh, for a zone specific to that evacuation uh, status. So as I showed earlier, um, if you click on that zone, it'll highlight it, it'll bring up that information card, uh, and then it'll give you that status. The so status is really the key one uh, to narrow into, and then also the reason uh, for what the uh, evacuation was uh, being ordered or uh, the warning was being ordered for. Um, each of the zones, once uh, it uh, is the status is changed, it will change color. Um, so those colors are important, and I'm going to cover those in a, a slide here in a minute. But uh, when you look at that zone, um, it's going to either be uh, red, yellow, blue, uh, or there's some specific ones uh, that represent other details such as green. Uh, for uh, repopulation after an evacuation. So uh, let me go to the next slide here and we'll talk a little bit more in depth. So if the zone is red in color, um, it's gonna be under an evacuation order. That basically means that all residents need to evacuate immediately and seek shelter outside of that danger zone. Uh, if the zone is yellow, uh, that means that an evacuation warning has been issued and you need to take caution that there's potential threat uh, to life and property and resident, residents should be packing up essential documents and belongings and be prepared to evacuate the area at a moment's notice. Now, when you get to the blue, it's a little less um, uh, serious, but it's still pretty serious because it's an advisory and it's basically a precautionary notice uh, that the intent to give residents time to prepare uh, for a possible evacuation. So this is really the time you need to be looking at that large animal um, situation. If you've got trailers, getting hooked up to trucks, getting ready to make that move uh, and, and, and keeping very informed on what the fire is doing so that you can uh, be uh, out in front of that and be prepared. Um, when you see green, uh, that's basically uh, our notice uh, with law enforcement and all of our other cooperating partners. Uh, uh, they all clear to repopulate. That means that it's safe to return to your home. Uh, but be aware of your surroundings when you do return home and make sure you return, uh, you use your uh, returning home checklist uh, to make sure everything's safe. Um, if a zone is changed purple or magenta, uh, I guess that's more of a proper color, um, that's a shelter in place. This uh, basically means that uh, you need to find a safe location indoors and be prepared to be self-sustained until further notice uh, and then, or you're contacted by emergency personnel um, for additional direction. And then if you just have a, a white um, a clear color or it's just the natural color of the zone, uh, then it's back to their normal status and they don't need to be uh, having concerns. So step two in our pressure preparation, um, is to sign up for your uh, evacuation alerts uh, for yourself and your loved ones. Uh, these are some pretty easy uh, processes for you to um, conduct. Uh, some of the best ways to stay informed about wildfires during the summertime months uh, or any time of the year about emergency incidents um, is you can go to the CAL FIRE um, uh, incident page, which is uh, the www.calfire.ca.gov forward slash incidents. And that's where you'll find uh, uh, up-to-date information on incidents that are uh, occurring. And then you can also go to uh, our CAL FIRE Twitter page. Uh, and more importantly, for the local area in San Mateo or Santa Cruz County, uh, you can go to our um, Twitter page, which is www.twitter.com forward slash CAL FIRE CZU. And that's where you're going to find reports on uh, our local incidents that are occurring um, uh, in the unit. Um, as far as... Uh, signing up for uh, different types of alerts. In Santa Cruz County, it's very, very important that uh, you register for code red um, to receive reverse 911 notifications and other important information uh, that may be coming out based on uh, those evacuation or reverse 911 uh, uh, type uh, alerts that you can get. And you can go to www.scr911.org 
And that'll take you to the Santa Cruz Regional 911 Dispatch Center webpage. Um, and I'll show you just in a minute that there's a uh, specific uh, couple buttons you can push to register for Code Red. And in San Mateo County, I know we've uh, talked about this in our other previous uh, 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 messages, but just in case there's folks from San Mateo County on the call tonight, um, San Mateo County utilizes SMC Alert to notify of incidents or conditions in the areas uh, that you may live in. And you can go to that website at http uh, colon forward slash forward slash hsd.smcsheriff.com forward slash SMC Alert. Uh, and that'll give you uh, um, information on how to register uh, for all those alerts on both of those uh, platforms. <clears throat> so here is a incident uh, uh, summary sheet. Um, so these are available. This is what you're probably going to see when you go to that CAL FIRE website. Uh, it's going to give you incident uh, information or facts. It's going to give you the current situation. Uh, and then it's going to talk about uh, evacuation warnings uh, and some other evacuation details. So these are just uh, things for you to stay informed on uh, so you can stay up to date on the current situation uh, if you get evacuated. So step three in our preparation um, is right now is preparing, right? That's what you're here for tonight. Uh, it's starting to prepare now. Um, you, you gotta be uh, forward thinking and, and be ready. Uh, this year could be a, a banner year again uh, with our low fuel moistures and the lack of precipitation. So uh, getting that preparation done early uh, is, is, is key to being successful. Uh, the likelihood that your family um, will survive an emergency situation like a wildfire or earthquake depends on uh, largely on you and your family uh, taking the time to put a plan together uh, in those things that uh, Chief Cosgrave spoke about, the ready set, right? Um, now it's all about exercising that plan. So um, you got to have the tools and the plan in place prior to the emergency occurring. But one of the key elements here is once you have that plan and those tools in place is to exercise that and try to exercise it frequently, uh, not just once a year. Um, you should be doing it two, three times a year, just so everybody is familiar with it uh, and, and is ready to go, especially as we're moving into our, our fire season. It's more important now than ever to practice that plan. If you don't have the plan, is to put it together and then practice it. Um, as part of that plan is making sure that you know your evacuation route. Um, most areas, unless you live on a one-way road, uh, have multiple ways in and out of the community. Uh, if you don't, you do live on a one-way road, that feeder road may have multiple ways in and out. So knowing how to get in and out of your communities now is important before that emergency cure occurs. So uh, when you do get notified, you can make a decision on what's gonna be the safest route out of your community. Um, utilize resources like our uh, Zone Haven for information, uh, Code Red uh, and SMC alerts to be notified uh, and stay ahead of that curve because uh, uh, things can, can progress uh, very quickly, uh, as we saw last year with the CZ alert. So here's a little bit about Code Red uh, notifications or alerts. Santa Cruz County uses Code Red. It is our reverse 911 system here in the county. Uh, it's a mass notification system that allows public safety agencies within Santa Cruz County to alert you, the public, of uh, any kind of emergency that could uh, be in, put you in harm's way. Um, to receive these messages within Santa Cruz County, you need to register your cellular phone or your landline um, phone numbers to receive these alerts. Um, uh, such, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, to receive these alerts. This is an opt-in system. Uh, so you have to register to receive these. Uh, you can also register uh, landlines and also locations of uh, not only your home, but your work uh, or say your child's preschool or even a relative's residence that you want to be kept uh, informed on. Uh, if events occur in that geographical area. You can also download the Code Red application uh, from your favorite app store. Uh, both Android and Apple platforms have them. Um, the nice part about the Code Red system, uh, if you are traveling in areas of the state or the country that use Code Red um, and you have the application in the notification mode, uh, it will alert you when you're in those geographical areas. Uh, when a notification um, uh, is about potential uh, safety hazards or concern is issued. Uh, you'll receive a message um, from either a voice or a text communication, uh, depending on what you signed up for um, when you registered your device. So 
uh, I would recommend that uh, you, you proactively go to that website if you already haven't done it and uh, register for Code Red if you live in Santa Cruz County. Um, I know there was a, a question earlier in the chat that I tried to answer. Um, if you live on a border, uh, either in San Mateo to the Santa Cruz border or the Santa Clara County uh, borders, um, it's good to make sure that you register for all these um, uh, alerts so that you can stay prepared because uh, the fire doesn't necessarily have to be in our county to put you in harm's way. Um, the other thing is um, with Code Red, uh, you are, have unlimited number of devices that you can register. So um, it's uh, really important that uh, you get whatever devices are, uh, you want uh, registered and uh, be ready for that alert if it does need to come. Um, and once again, it does not work if you do not register. Like I said, it is an opt-in uh, system. So this is the uh, homepage of the Santa Cruz County uh, Regional 911 Dispatch Center's website. Um, as it, you can see, there's the uh, link uh, to the website there. But um, here are the two buttons you can push. If you just uh, push this top button that says sign up for reverse 911, that'll take you to the registration. Or you can go down to this red circled area down here uh, and click on code red, and that will take you to the registration page. So for San Mateo uh, County uh, um, uh, SMC alerts, um, it's a mass notification system uh, that allows uh, safety agencies in San Mateo County to alert you. Uh, this is a, a, a Everbridge system is the host of the alerting system. Um, you know, to receive those messages uh, focused on specific neighborhoods in San Mateo County, uh, you have to register uh, or you can register up to five addresses uh, in the alert system, such as your home, work, or child, uh, or a relative's residence, uh, but you can only, this is limited up to five uh, addresses. So uh, unlike Code Red where it has unlimited, this does have some little bit of restriction to it. Uh, when notifications uh, of potential hazards or concerns, uh, you'll receive a message, either a voice or a text uh, through common uh, methods of communication uh, that you registered for on that uh, site. And then once again, this is a, an opt-in system. Uh, and if you don't register for it, it does not work. So uh, this is the page if you go to uh, SMC alert or you go to uh, follow that link that I stated earlier, this is where it's gonna take you. And as you can see, there's a registration uh, over in the far corner to register for the SMC alerts. So let's talk a little bit about alert wildfire cameras. Um, so the alert wildfire cameras are a um, series of cameras uh, that are part of a consortium of three universities uh, that have linked uh, through a network um, these uh, alert verification cameras. Uh, University of uh, Nevada at Reno, the University of San Diego, uh, and the University of Oregon are the three universities that have put this uh, uh, series of cameras together throughout uh, the Western United States uh, to help us with validating uh, uh, wildland fire starts uh, and um, give us information uh, in our toolboxes uh, so that we can uh, validate where a fire may be and what the potential it is to have uh, and where it's going to move to. These consist of cameras positioned throughout the state, as I said. Uh, typically, they're placed on high vantage points or, or areas uh, that can see into uh, drainages and things like that so that we can get good vantage points. Um, these are used to locate those new fires and then monitor that activity um, as it goes. Uh, I am going to try do one thing here real quick. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. Uh, bear with me one second. And then I'm going to click on this here. And I'm going to try to share my screen again so you can see what the, this looks like. So, All right, you see the alert wildfire uh, web page? Yes. Maybe? Okay, so perfect. So uh, this is the alert wildfire web page. And if you zoom out, I'll get it centered here so you can see it a little bit better. Um, sorry about that. Uh, as you can see, California um, has uh, quite a few cameras. So I'm going to zoom in here just lightly. I'm going to come in to how to get into Santa Cruz County or Santa Cruz. So um, we are located in the uh, south and east bay 
platform. So if you click on the South and East Bay platform, uh, it will bring up a list of cameras. Uh, and currently, this camera, let me uh, move up. This is uh, looking at, uh, this is a, a camera in Santa Clara. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click on the camera in Bonnie Dune. And when you click on that camera, this is the public site that you all can look at. Um, this is the view um, that was taken at uh, 719 this evening. So uh, depending on where that camera is pointed, um, some folks do have control of these cameras and can move them so that we can locate fires. Um, but you'll, you'll be able to see those vantage points. And then I'm just going to click on another camera here. This is a camera up on Mount Velasque. Um, so this is a camera looking towards the south off of Mount Velasque. So I won't spend much more time on that, but I just wanted to show you that um, if you go to www.alertwildfire.org forward slash, that'll take you to this site where you can actually um, see uh, these cameras uh, and uh, kind of have your own vantage point of um, what, that, uh, what that looks like. So let's see here, I'm going to start sharing again. Okay, I think I'm good to go. Uh, Dave, are you seeing that? Yep, your PowerPoint's back up. Okay, perfect. So um, Alert Wildfires uh, cameras are just another uh, tool that you have uh, available to you as a citizen to be able to look and see for your own eyes of what may be occurring uh, in a geographical area uh, near you. And that those cameras are positioned uh, throughout the, uh, the region um, we have several in San Mateo County and several in Santa Cruz County, and each day we're trying to get more and more of these cameras to help us with uh, validation and uh, protecting uh, you, the citizens. Okay, so that uh, concludes uh, my portion of the presentation, and uh, we are going to uh, have some question and answer now. So I will turn it back over to um, Chief Armstrong. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Yeah, and uh, Chief Cosgrave, did you have anything else before we moved on to uh, the last few minutes of questions and answers? Uh, just one of the questions that came up on Zonehaven uh, in the previous webinar. When you put your address in, don't be concerned when it doesn't put the little icon right on your residence. It puts it in the zone. It not, doesn't necessarily put it on your on your street at your address. Yeah. And then uh, on the zone haven uh, portion or on things as a whole, uh, sorry folks, I've been trying to kind of answer some of the questions as we went. And so I'll rapid fire kind of recap some of those and then we'll see if anybody else has any live questions that we can get to. Um, so handful of things came up. Um, sorry if I can get back to them. Uh, Lizanne just had a question about alert wildfire cameras, if any new ones were coming online in Santa Cruz County this year, and I kind of answered back to that. There are a couple, Chief Larkin just showed the Bonnie Dune and Mount Velasque ones, and we do have several others that are in the works, just kind of working through the process with um, alert wildfire. So hope, we hope to have, I believe, four more is the current that we're working on, and, and the sooner we can get those, uh, the better as we in our command center have control of those. Um, so those will be great tools to have. Uh, we answered a couple questions about as far as notifications go. And yeah, if you're on a, a border or like a tweener zone, um, yeah, I, I'd put in for whatever is available to you um, because it'll give you that much more. Uh, SMC Alerts does a, a phenomenal job of getting information out. So if you're right on the edge, can't hurt to have SMC Alerts. Uh, you're, you might get more notifications than you hope to, um, but uh, I'd rather have more than uh, not enough. Uh, and then um, the question just came up about um, the loud fire sirens, similar to the one in Felton. And uh, Chief and I were literally just having this conversation with some folks today. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the preliminary information that we have on those so far is that uh, our geography doesn't blend very well in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, just due to the amount of vegetation that we have, the um, you know, the amount of drainages and everything, you, you would need a, a, a ton of them to truly be effective. And then we start to run into, well, where do you put them? And, and you know, the landowner probably isn't gonna to be too happy to hear that thing exercised once a week and so forth. So it's an option. We definitely aren't saying no, um, but uh, it, it's just not something that we've uh, chosen to move forward with uh, just yet. 
And then uh, we did have one come through. I know um, there's not a real good mechanism. I'm, I'm focusing on the um, questions asked through uh, Zoom right now. We are streaming this live on Facebook as well. And there was a question about uh, if we were going to have uh, more vehicles or planes uh, this year. Uh, the, the answer is kind of yes and no. So um, CAL FIRE is, you know, it, it's about 1% of the statewide uh, budget total. And uh, we have several things in process that have been going on for several years. Uh, one of those is the replacement of our um, rotary wing aircraft or helicopter fleet, uh, replacing the old um, Hueys with, that uh, carried about 350 gallons of water with uh, basically the civilian version of Blackhawks that carry a thousand gallons of water. So several of those are already in service and we continue to replace more of those. Uh, they're also working on uh, uh, continuing a program to bring um, C-130s that were surplus from uh, the US Coast Guard into the CAL FIRE uh, air fleet that'll drop a significant amount larger uh, uh, retardant. Unfortunately, those are still another year or two off from full development. So working on those and they've, uh, we continue to contract uh, exclusive use contracts with additional rotary wing and uh, fixed wing aircraft from private vendors uh, during our, our peak fire season. But uh, at this, other than those things that we're already moving forward, we won't see any additional permanent funding for uh, rotary or fixed wing uh, aircraft this year. And I think that's pretty much it that wasn't left hanging so far. We do have just four or five minutes left. If anybody else has any live questions that they'd like to place in the chat on our Zoom. I'll just double back to my presentation real quick and just say that everything I presented about getting ready is all incumbent on the individual to do it's it's you can watch a thousand webinars uh, but unless you take action it, it, nothing will be done when the time comes so uh, people need to be proactive and do what they can to to help their situations i'll just dovetail into uh, chief product grades comment uh, the know your zone is important uh, uh, this is going to be the method that we use um, moving forward. So uh, the sooner you know your zone, um, what I will tell you, if you do have an alpha at the end of your zone because it's a split zone, um, the importance is to remember that you're in a alpha zone. Uh, the last character doesn't really uh, play a part unless you have a split zone uh, due to some other circumstance. So, but know your zone because that's what we're going to be uh, putting out for the press release or notifying the public through reverse ID. All right, so uh, yeah, I haven't seen anything else uh, come through. Uh, oh, let's see here. Um, Chief, I'll throw this one to you. Are there any or will there be any legal regulations to incentivize homeowners to clean up their properties? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Sorry about that, I'm reading off another device here. Are there, are there or will there be any legal regulations to incentivize homeowners to clean up their properties? So um, we do have our uh, public resources code where we go out and do our LA 100 inspections. Uh, and there's a process uh, where we move forward and uh, um, it could go to citation. Uh, as far as uh, an incentive or uh, anything of that nature, um, we're not really at the position to offer that or, or move that forward. Um, we just tried to get compliance from the property owner. Uh, and obviously with this last year, we saw the devastation that can occur. Um, so, uh, you know, working with that property owner to try to gain compliance is, uh, is our number one uh, factor. And, um, you know, as time moves forward and uh, if more money has become available through grants and things like that, communities, uh, we would be more than happy to sit down and have a conversation and find out ways to uh, work with you, the property owners, and your community to uh, potentially enter into an agreement there make some type of uh, fuel reduction program occur in your communities. And then uh, Chief, would you mind covering uh, Santa Clara County again? Is it SCC alerts? Is that what they uh, do Google for the Santa Clara folks? 
No, it's actually alert SCC, or I'm sorry, alert SCC. Um, so if you just do, if you Google alert SCC, um, it will take you to their site and then uh, you can click on the registration. Um, it, it's operated under the Office of Emergency Services for Santa Clara County. All right, thank you for that one. And then just saw another question come through on our Zoom side from Margaret. Uh, we live in Lompico and there's only one way in or out. Is there anything special we should know to do? And Margaret, I think the best thing for us, that the, the best advice we can give is uh, get out early. I mean, especially uh, we're, we're, we're sensitive to um, uh, you folks that live out there in Lompico and Ziani. And uh, yeah, we know it's limited one way in and out. We uh, discuss your area in great detail. And uh, man, if there's uh, anybody on this presentation that, uh, or, you know, viewing tonight um, that we would like to reach on this ha as far as having things set early and not needing to uh, waste time when the time comes, it it's folks in situations like yourself. So please be prepared, uh, have those go bags, have where you're going to go, have your plan and practice it. And, uh, you know, if we issue warnings, uh, there's nothing to say that you have to wait until it comes to be in order. Um, so when those warnings come out, that's a good time to start moving. And then uh, it looks like we aren't seeing anything else come through and uh, our time is up for the evening. So we do thank you all for uh, coming and participating tonight, uh, getting this information. We will be having uh, another uh, presentation two weeks from tonight on the 24th on home hardening and defensible space steps you guys can take to make your home more resilient uh, in the case of a fire in the area so we hope that you can join us then uh, we'll be getting that out through our next door twitter uh, facebook and all those avenues uh, as soon as we can and on that um, follow us on twitter that's a great way for us to get out information uh, as incidents are happening it's just more situational awareness uh, that's probably our quickest way that we've we push out when there's new fires and updates to fires and so forth in the area. So uh, with that, again, thank you all for coming on and have a great evening. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.